I want to read about a place that most of us are looking forward to visiting, indeed to staying at. I'd like to think that everybody who can hear my voice at this moment, we're looking forward to going there and could have such a tremendous dream to keep them going every day. But listen to these words. They're the very last two pages of the Bible, book of Revelation, chapter 21. Then I saw a new earth with no oceans and a new sky, for the present earth and sky had disappeared. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. It was a glorious sight, beautiful as a bride at her wedding. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, the home of God is now among men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people. Yes, God himself will be with them. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. All of that is gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And then he said to me, Write this down. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. It is finished. I am the A and the Z, the beginning and the end. I will give to the thirsty the springs of the water of life as a gift. Everyone who conquers will inherit all these blessings, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But cowards who turn back from following me and those who are unfaithful to me and the corrupt and murderers and the immoral and those conversing with demons and idol worshippers and all liars, their doom is in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had emptied the flasks containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come with me and I will show you the bride the lamb's wife and in a vision he took me to a towering mountain peak and from there I watched that wondrous city the holy Jerusalem descending out of the skies from God it was filled with the glory of God and flashed and glowed like a precious gem crystal clear like Jasper its walls were broad and high with twelve gates guarded by twelve angels and the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, north, south, east and west. The walls had twelve foundation stones and on them were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel held in his hand a golden measuring stick to measure the city and its gates and walls and when he measured it he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, it was in the form of a cube. For its height was exactly the same as its other dimensions, 1,500 miles each way. Then he measured the thickness of the walls and found them to be 216 feet across. The angel called out these measurements to me using standard units. The city itself was transparent gold like glass. The wall was made of jasper and was built on twelve layers of foundation stones inlaid with gems. First layer with jasper, the second with sapphire, the third with chalcedony, the fourth with emerald, the fifth with sardonyx, the sixth layer with sardis, the seventh with chrysolite, the eighth with beryl, the ninth with topaz, the tenth with chrysopase, the eleventh with jacinth, and the twelfth with amethyst. The twelve gates were made of pearls, each gate of a single pearl. And the main street was pure, transparent gold, like glass. No temple could be seen in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are worshipped in it everywhere. And the city has no need of sun or moon to light it, for the glory of God and of the Lamb illuminate it. Its light will light the nations of the earth, and the rulers of the world will come and bring their glory to it. Its gates never close. They stay open all day long, and there is no night. And the glory and honor of all the nations shall be brought into it. Nothing evil will be permitted in it, 
no one immoral or dishonest, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he pointed out to me a river of pure water of life, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, coursing down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew trees of life bearing twelve crops of fruit and a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. There shall be nothing in the city which is evil, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be written on their foreheads. There will be no night there, no need of lamps or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. I am coming soon. God who tells his prophets what the future holds has sent his angel to tell you this will happen soon. Blessed are those who believe it and all else written in this book. I find that there are two strangely contradictory attitudes towards the future, both fighting for our attention today. On the one hand are those who want to think more about the future and want us to live in the future, and on the other hand there are those who don't want to think about the future at all, and either live merely for the present or run away into the past. An example of the first attitude is this book, Future Shock, by Alvin Toffler a book which is having a very disturbing and yet exciting effect on people's thinking about the future. Anybody here read it? Just one, two. Peter Savage has. I thought you would have, Peter. It's an exciting book. Its subject really is what happens to people when they're subject to change, especially when those changes come so thick and fast that there is a crisis of adaptation to the changes and all kinds of physical illnesses and psychological illnesses and social disturbances, says the author, are symptoms of people having to change too quickly. I think some of our church members in this fellowship have shown the symptoms of trying to cope with the changes that we've had to make to keep this church in the second half of the 20th century. And he's saying really that these changes are accelerating and that we have now broken with the past for good, whether we like it or not, and that we've got to learn to live with the future. He quotes one person who says this, that more has happened in the world since I was born than happened in the world before I was born. And do you know that's true? More has happened in our world since you were born in it than happened in the world before you were born. 75% of all the scientists who've ever been are still alive. And this is the kind of changing world in which we live. He outlines the changes in technology and many other things in his book. And he says this, it is vital that we establish the study of futurology. That's a new word to you anyway. But I'm sure you've realized that all over the world, in Berlin, in Paris, in London, in uh, Tokyo, in Washington, there have been set up think tanks for the future under a variety of names. There are now journals devoted to scientific study of futurology. And he's saying that the only way we'll cope with the rate of change is to anticipate those changes, be ahead of them and shape them. So we've just got to learn to live in the future. And there are three commissions sitting at this moment. One is studying simply the year 2000, the second is called Europe 2000, and the third is called Mankind 2000. And they're trying to pierce the future and find out what the world will be like in 2000 so that now in 1973 we may get people ready for it so that when it comes they won't collapse out of sheer future shock. Now that's the man saying we must think of the future more and live in it. But over the last 25 years the opposite viewpoint has also come and that is there may not be a future to live in so live now in the present. 
This outlook started in a day I shall never forget. Can you remember the day I opened a newspaper and there was a photograph of a huge mushroom-shaped cloud? And as I read that article, I knew the world could never be the same again. We now have to live with the possibility that someone may press the wrong button. And yet even that threat has been overshadowed in the last 10 years by the biological bomb. And when I visit schools, it shatters me to discover that young people today are living with the possibility of the end of our world. It's part of their thinking. It's part of their outlook. Now, it never was mine. When I was at school, I thought the world was going on and on and on. And now we're living in a generation that thinks the end is just round the corner. So why have a career? Why prepare for 40 years service? After all, it may be next year and we're gone. So let's get on with it now. Let's enjoy now. Let's get with it now. That's the feeling of this other outlook. Let me give you some facts and figures. I went into Guildford Technical College not long ago for a, to see an exhibition. And there was a computer. And there was a young boy operating it and feeding stuff in. I said, what are you trying to work out on the computer? He said, I'm trying to work out the date of the end of the world. You're not serious. Yes, I am. And he was. It wasn't a joke. In the University of Massachusetts, they fed 600 equations into a computer. Things like the world's food supply, the world's resources of energy, things like the population growth rate, things like the pollution of fresh water, and they fed 600 equations. Among them, for example, that it requires one acre of land per person per year for enough food for that person. That's taking the whole land area. And by the way, by 1990, we shall have run out of one acre per person, all the land in the whole of our planet. And they fed in these equations and they said, when is doomsday? And the computer came out with one figure straight away, around 2000 AD. Which means that if that goes on and all those trends continue at their present rate, my children will not die of old age. They then fed into the computer various possible answers to the problems. And they came up with this program just to survive. And this is the program. It's called Stabilized World Model Number One. Seven things have to be done in order to stabilize the situation. Number one, births must equal deaths. There must be 100% sure con contraceptive freely given. And families must be forcibly limited to two children only. Number two, pollution must be reduced 75%. Number three, the use of our resources like coal, oil, and iron must be reduced by 75%. Number four, we must double food production and distribution by the year 2000. Number five, we must shift from consumer goods and spend our money on education and health. Number six, we must end built-in obsolescence so that you buy a car to wear out in five years' time or less. And seventh, we must spend huge sums of money to conserve, enrich, and reclaim our soil. And the biggest thing is the machine said we've got to get all that going by 1975 to alter 2000. Now that's the situation in which we live. And it's no wonder that though on the one hand people like Alvin Toffler say we've got to live in the future, we've got to consider the future, others are saying there's no point. And so you either get people living what we call existentially, which means living for the existence of today and just living for what experiences they can squeeze out of the now. Or we get the nostalgia that tries to get back into some golden age of the past. So hippies living in caves out in, on the islands of the Mediterranean are trying to get back to some prehistoric ideal age. And those of us who go back to the 20s in fashion and music are trying to recover an era between the wars when we felt reasonably happy. Now we've got to live in the future. Do you know that every decision you take every day is related to the future? The husband who kisses his wife at half past eight and says, I'll be home at six, have my tea ready, please, has made at least a dozen ass assumptions about the future. Assumes his wife will still be there when he gets back. Assumes the trains will be running from Waterloo. 
he assumes that, uh, well, you just go on. He's made a dozen assumptions about the future in just saying that. Every step we take is geared to our assumptions about the future. You can't ignore the future. And what you believe about the future is affecting your daily life and every practical and moral decision you make is related in some way to the immediate or ultimate future. And that is why I feel in a sense I must try and understand and not blame a whole generation of young people who are just living it up regardless of moral standards or anything else on the grounds that we're not going to be here much longer. If that's all the future they've got, they are behaving consistently and logically. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And the young people are not alone in behaving this way. The older folk, in a more refined way, in living for their own immediate comfort, are doing exactly the same thing. Now then, I'm going to switch now from the world's talk about the future, which has occupied me so far, to the thought, are you finding it difficult to adapt to all the changes that are taking place? You feeling it's we're racing into an unknown future and you can't cope, that you can't even cope with the comparatively minor changes that are taking place in church life, much less, much less the world outside. You feel like that? Then I've got good news for you. And the good news for you is this, that we do know what it's all coming to. Those of you who've been here on Sunday morning studying Daniel with me will, will know a lot of what I'm going to say already, but I'm going to try and put it together into a pattern tonight. God knows the future, God plans the future, and God tells the future. And he does it so that we may live the present correctly by relating ourselves rightly to what's going to happen. It's the only way you can live, sensibly and righteously. And I'm going to go through the Bible now, which is our source book of what is going to happen. Here it is. Three and a half million letters, quarter of a million words. 66 books, 1,000 chapters, one book, and a quarter of it, as I said this morning, over a quarter of it contains predictions about the future, 27% of the verses in it. And altogether, as I've said in Sunday mornings, 737 events of the future are predicted, many of them in great detail. And of those 737 major events predicted in the Bible, over 80% have already come true. And here's something that will make you sit up. There are only 12 more to come true before the end of this age. Only 12. And we're there. Only 12. Now the Bible tells us many things beyond the end of our age because that's not the end. It's the end of this age, this present evil age, but it's not the end. And so the Bible's looking forward beyond that so that you may relate to what lies beyond because whether you like it or not, you're part of that future. Don't you ever believe the devil's lie that death is the end of you? It isn't either way, as we shall see. Well, now let's look at the Bible and see what it says. There are some differences of opinion among Christians on some of the things in the future where either the Bible is ambiguous or people have fallen under the spell of a strong interpretation. And I'm going to indicate just a couple of major points where there is difference of opinion among Bible-believing Christians so that you may be aware of some of the discussions that Christians are open-minded enough to have. I'll indicate where my own convictions lie, but leave you to do what the Bereans did in Acts 17, and having listened to someone preach out of the Bible, they went home and got their Bibles and checked up on him to see if these things were so, and that's what I want you to do. Now, the first sermon tonight, in a sense, the first part, is about this present evil age. That's a term that's used in the New Testament to describe now. And what the trends are likely to be and how this evil age will finish. And there's a fairly clear pattern in the Bible about this. Let me run through some of the trends. You'll find quite a lot of teaching in Jesus' teaching. You'll find in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and Mark 13, Jesus' teaching about the future. And there are many other passages in the New Testament and Old which give us indications of what to expect. Here are some of the trends. First of all, social trends. The Bible indicates an increasing desire for pleasure-seeking, an increasing lawlessness and defiance of recognized authority, increasing violence, increasing immorality, increasing fear, 
increasing breakup of family life, increasing conflict between different social groups, age groups, parents and teenagers, employers and employees, increasing knowledge about the world but decreasing knowledge about any other world. That's, that's a kind of social trend. And if I sum it up in a sense in two phrases, an increase in homosexual bodies and in antisocial minds. Now that's the kind of trend that the Bible talks about socially. What about political trends? The Bible seems to indicate a change from democracy to dictatorship, the decline of democratic forms of government and the increase of autocratic forms of government. It's been interesting to see the switch. 24 royal thrones of Europe collapsed between two world wars. 24. We have just hung on to our royal family as a symbol, little more. But 24 thrones collapsed in that period. And the idea was to replace them with democracies. But you can't hold on to democracy. It's an unstable form of government. And in the chaos that comes out of a democratic situation, then the strong man who steps in with an autocratic promise to put things right is accepted by the people who are sick of the anarchy in which everyone does what's right in his own eyes. And you've seen this pattern in Europe, you're seeing it in the world now. A third of the world's population is under totalitarian government, probably more than that, and it's increasing all the time. And one of the features of our day is that the military coup takes over government. The people with an autocratic outlook become the governors and the rulers of our world. Also politically, I am personally convinced the Bible most clearly teaches that Israel has a future as a nation and is to be yet again the hinge of the last days of history. And her return to the promised land I see as very significant indeed. But Jesus spoke of the last days as days in which the nations would be in great perplexity and would be rushing around seeking peace and security. That's not a bad description of our day. The third trend is in the ecclesiastical world where the Bible indicates that there will be deceivers and false lying prophets and teachers and preachers who will only want to tickle the crowd's fancy and who will preach and teach things that are not true to the word of God, fables, fancies, and myths. There will be a growth in cults, a growth in false saviors and messiahs, a growth in the kind of thing we saw recently when the 15-year-old boy came here and was treated as God. The borderline between the church and the world is likely to be eliminated by the love of many growing cold and by many professing Christians losing the power of God even though they still have the form of godliness. It's a disturbing picture of an ecclesiastical scene that gets weak and gets too much mixed up with world and doesn't draw the line sharply enough. On the natural scene it seems that the Bible indicates that nature herself will be reflecting the disturbance morally among men. Now I shall be speaking about this tomorrow at the Graduates Fellowship. I'm not sure if that's an open meeting. I think it probably is. Can somebody tell me? In principle, yes. In principle, yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, that's not a commercial. Forget it. But we shall be thinking then of the relationship between man and nature. Is there a kind of psychosomatic relationship between man and nature? Are plants affected by being talked to them when they grow? That's just a kind of silly illustration of the deep principle. And the Bible does indicate that nature herself is bound up in sin and that the whole creation groans and travails waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. Now it is therefore no coincidence that Jesus speaks of natural disasters as increasing towards the end of history. We can expect more earthquakes we can expect more natural disturbances and disasters. And the Bible says that towards the very end you will see startling things happen in the heavens. You will see stars being moved. You will see comets. You will see other things. And while I'm not among those who are panicking at the comet that is just coming fairly near us right now, 
I believe that we shall see more of this in the heavens as we get towards the end of our age and scientists will wonder why is there an increase in such phenomena. And finally in the spiritual realm I can predict this that as we get nearer to the end of this evil age the gospel will get into every country and every tribe and every tongue and every kindred and you've heard that in the last ten years it's got into every country. It's now got to press on to every tribe and every tongue. It's got into perhaps two and a half thousand tongues now out of six thousand. But we're pressing on. The major ones are covered. The minor ones are coming up. You see, this is one of the trends. A trend in worldwide evangelism. Do you know that more evangelism is being done today than it's been done for two thousand years? The church is growing more rapidly today than it's done for two thousand years. And I'm glad that Peter reminded us of these exciting facts. Yes, we should be proud, not of ourselves, not of the church. Let him that boasts, boast in the Lord. But we're proud of our God. We're proud of our Jesus who said, I will build my church. And he's making a good job of it. And he's building his church. And so the spiritual trends are to worldwide evangelism, maybe decreasing numbers. Jesus himself said, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. But they'll be there. And also there will be suffering and persecution on a greater scale than hitherto for the people of God. It will become more and more difficult for you to come to the Millmead Center and worship. The nearer we get to the end of this evil age. In fact the whole thing is building up to what is called in the Bible the big trouble. The big trouble. I could spend a lot of time just talking about this. Let me just paint it very quickly. You'll find it mentioned in those three chapters I mentioned earlier, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. You'll find it throughout the book of Daniel, chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 9, end of chapter 11. You'll find it right through the book of Revelation. You'll find it in 2 Thessalonians. And from these books you can put together a picture. And the picture that emerges is this, of ten countries uniting in the Middle East and three of the rulers of those countries being replaced by one who starts small at first but becomes the most powerful dictator this world has ever seen. Becomes what we call antichrist. That word anti is misleading. It means quite simply instead of. Who offers the world peace and security in return for his total control and who gives peace and security to an, a world lost in anarchy but at the cost of absolute control not only of their bodies and minds but of their spirits in ordering state worship and himself as God. And in that period which will be peace and security for the world until it leads to the last world war of all the big trouble is for the people of God won't be big trouble for the world but for the people of God for such a totalitarian regime cannot stand people who acknowledge a higher authority and a higher obedience than to the state and so here's the picture of big trouble looming I'm going to mention now the first point at which Christians have differences and have a discussion and I want to mention them very frankly the big question is, all Christians who accept this big trouble agree that the Jews are going to go through it as the people of God. They're right in the Middle East situation anyway. But the question is whether the Christians will have to face that as well. There are three views. The first view, which was held for pretty well most of the last 2,000 years, and hence is called the classical view, the view that was held from the days of the New Testament onwards was the view that Christians also would be in that big trouble. That the only ones who would escape would be those who died before it or were martyred during it. And that Revelation 7 describes those who are martyred during the big trouble for it says these are they who are coming out of the big tribulation, the big trouble. And you certainly can't come out of a thing unless you've been in it. And it describes that noble army of martyrs who will suffer the supreme penalty for their faith. But the classical view has been that Christ comes at the end of that big trouble, which thank God he's kept limited in his plan to a very short time, only a matter of a year or two, that Jesus will come at the end 
and that the church will meet him in the air and at last be free from the big trouble. It was only about 150 years ago or so that a man called Bullinger produced a new idea, a belief, and he got it after studying his Bible, a belief that before the big trouble the church would be taken out of the world to be with the Lord and would therefore escape that grand climax of suffering and that therefore we may expect the return of Jesus before the trouble and therefore we will not know when it will be, it could be any moment. From Bullinger the idea was accepted by a man called J.N. Darby who founded the Brethren and from Darby it went to a man called Schofield who produced a Schofield Bible and introduced this idea to the notes. From there it spread throughout the world. Now it may be right, I point out first that it is a new idea and has only appeared in the last century or two and second I would ask you to keep an open mind on this subject. I want you to search the Bible. Don't listen to me, don't listen to anybody else. Do what I did, get your Bible and go right into it. I will tell you very frankly that I am convinced that the view that was held throughout the centuries is the correct one and that we must prepare each other for suffering. But that is my own conviction and I'm not preaching it dogmatically. Search the scriptures to see whether these things be so and come to your own honest convictions. Whether you believe in being caught up at any moment or before the great trouble or afterwards, it's only a matter of a few years. And whenever it is, we'll all be there. And we'll be so caught up with the glory of Jesus, we will not be saying to each other, I told you so. <laughs> and having done that, you see, I've realized I am now unsound <laughs> to many people. I think we've got to have the courage to be unsound, if you like, and to search the word of God until we really come through to an understanding of what we believe. Either way, the next great event in world history is Jesus coming again. I personally cannot preach, and you've noticed that I do not preach, that it may be tonight, and you must be ready tonight, in case you wake up in the morning and the family's gone. I do not believe that that is the kind of appeal that the apostles used, or that is New Testament, essentially. We are to get ready for the coming judge, whether it's tonight or whenever. That's important. But here we have the call to be ready. And if it's going to be any time, I can't make any sense of the word watch. What do you watch for? You'd have to go around looking like that. We are to watch the signs of the times. And Jesus said, look, when you see a red sky at night, you say, it's going to be, what, I've forgotten. Yes, good, tomorrow. <laughs> and when you see red sky in the morning, you say, bad weather's on the way. Oh, you can read the signs of the sky, but why can't you read the signs of the times? Why can't you watch and see what's happening? Watch and pray. Get ready. Yes, to the world he'll come like a thief in the night, but the Bible says to you Christians who are watching and awake, he will not come unexpectedly. He will not come as a thief in the night. You'll know exactly when he's coming because you're alert and awake. And that seems to me to indicate that we shall see the signs first. Not unexpectedly, but we'll watch and we'll pray and we'll get excited. And as the world goes down, Christians will come up. And as everybody looks down in the mouth and downcast, we lift up our heads for the day of our redemption draws near. Well, now, that's the next great event in the world. 300 times it's referred to in the New Testament. Physically, visibly, Jesus is coming back to his land. Antichrist is the second last ruler in history. Christ is the last. And Antichrist must give way to Christ. You know, the devil once offered Jesus the post of Antichrist. He said, you bow down to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And that's what he will one day give to Antichrist. But Christ said, no, they're my fathers and they're for him. And so when Jesus comes back, the king comes back, the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. And our prayer that we've already sung this evening will be answered gloriously. I want now to talk about what will happen after he comes back. And there are many things to mention here. And the first, I'm afraid I'm going to begin with another difference of opinion among Christians, just so that you're in the picture, and I want you to go and search your Bible. There is a chapter in the book of Revelation which says that when Jesus comes, he will reign for a thousand years on earth before ever he gets on with the new heaven and the new earth and the final recreation of the universe. This has puzzled many people. At first sight, taken in its plain, simple sense, it would appear to mean what it says. 
and on the whole it's a good rule of Bible interpretation to take the simplest, plainest meaning unless there's a reason for not doing so. And it seems that far from coming to take us immediately to heaven, that passage teaches that he will first of all set up his kingdom on earth rather than in heaven. Now let me again say there have been three views on this one. The classical view, the view that was held through most of the centuries of the history of the church, has been to take that at its face value and believe that when we pray thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying for exactly this, that when the king comes back that he will actually take over this world government and demonstrate his power to reign in righteousness and peace right here and the nations will then be able to stop war and will know under Jesus the kind of world that we could have had if we'd accepted him earlier. But it will be imposed by force and therefore it will not be freely accepted by everyone and at the end of that demonstration of his power there will still be those who say, I do not want to live in the kingdom of the Lord. Now that's the simplest, plainest sense and it's the view that was held for many centuries. Then came another view and that was that this reign of Christ on earth was to be set up by the church before Christ appeared so that the church's missionary task is to extend the kingdom on earth until we have Christianized the entire world and then at the end of that Christ can come back as king and take over his kingdom and take us all to heaven. The first view I mentioned is called the premillennial view which means Christ comes pre the millennium or thousand years. Millennium just means a thousand. And the second I've mentioned is called the post-millennial view, which means that he comes at the end of a thousand years after which, of, in which the church has Christianized the world, a view that finds its place in perhaps the majority of our missionary hymns of the Victorian era, when things were going so well in Britain and for Britain that we thought the kingdom of God was round the corner in the 20th century. The third view has arisen more strongly in the last few years, and it is the a millennial view, am I getting you complicated? The a millennial view, which doesn't believe there will be a millennium at all, but that the millennium, really, that thousand years, is a kind of symbolic number, a spiritual figure referring to that reign of Christ in our hearts so that people enter that reign of Christ when they are converted and are already living in a personal millennium with him so that there isn't going to be a thousand years on earth either before he comes or after in which he's reigning but we shall go straight to heaven. So we've got a millennial, pre-millennial, post-millennial. How complicated can you get? A friend of mine went to Northern Ireland and when he got there he was put on the spot straight away and he said, um, are you an a millennial, pre-millennial or post-millennial? They like to know over there, by the way. And so he said, that is a preposterous question, <laughs> which I thought was a perfect answer. <laughs> Again, I can only indicate that um, my own understanding is premillennial. I take those words in their simplest sense, and I take it that Christ will come and reign on earth before he finally recreates the universe. But I remain close friends with those who differ from me and I don't think it's a thing we should split our fellowship over. And there is room for us to study the word. I'll tell you what, when it happens we'll have no more arguments, so let's leave it there. I'm now going to concentrate on those things which those of all those three views agree upon as being clearly taught in the Bible. Things that will follow Jesus' return or from his return onwards. Number one, the resurrection of our bodies. We don't believe in a vague spiritual future with us all floating around as spooks. As death separates body and spirit, so Jesus' return unites body and spirit. And our bodies, our new bodies given to us will enable us to have physical, if you like, physical communication, shaking hands as people touched Jesus after his resurrection, as Jesus ate fish. That's why I believe that heaven must be a place. In fact, heaven to me is a new earth as well. And unless your idea of heaven includes the earth, it's not biblical. And so we believe in a universe, a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place. 
And for a place, that's a, a space relationship that requires a body, and we believe in the resurrection of the body. That's why Archbishop William Temple said Christianity is the most materialist of all the world religions. We believe in the resurrection of the body. No Christian creed has ever said, I believe in the immortality of the soul. When this mortal soul, mortal soul, puts on an immortal body, then death is swallowed up in victory. It's our souls that are mortal needing an immortal body. And that's part of the future when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, do you know that those who've died before you will get there first? Don't believe the dead will be left behind. They'll be there before we are. And we'll catch up with those who have been dead in Christ. And they will rise first and we shall meet them in the air. Hallelujah. So whether I'm dead and gone, well, if I am, I'll get there first. <laughs> and if I'm still around, I'll catch up pretty soon afterwards. Resurrection of the body. If you believe, as I do, in a millennium on earth, then the resurrection of the body will be split into what the Bible calls the first resurrection and the second the first of those who believe in Jesus who rise to reign with him and the second resurrection of those who rise who are unbelievers and I want you to note that the Bible teaches that the wicked will have a resurrection of the body and just as those who die in Christ will have a beautiful body those who die outside of Christ will have a horrible one that reflects the inner spirit and so when you laugh at hell being physical torment, just remember that those there have bodies. The resurrection of the body is for both. In Daniel chapter 12 and in John chapter 5, you find that it teaches clearly that both wicked and good rise from the dead. You'll see all the wicked people again. They will rise from the dead to be judged. Which brings me to the second thing of which we are absolutely sure, judgment. Why is Christ coming back? He's coming back to judge it is he who will judge men. God has appointed Jesus as the judge. And one thing I can promise you is this, that no matter how or when you die, you will one day stand before God and Jesus, his appointed judge, and Jesus will say, what did you do with the life we gave you? And you will answer to him. There isn't one of us here would be happy about a tape recording of all the things we've ever said being played to this congregation. There isn't one of us here who would be happy about a film being shown to this congregation of all we've done. Much less thoughts and feelings in the heart. But on that day, no secrets will be hid. None at all. It is the day, as Paul said, when God will judge the secrets of men through the man Christ Jesus. There is only one way to get ready for that day, that day now, and that's you get to Jesus as quickly as you can. For there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You get your sins forgiven and dealt with by the blood of Jesus, or that day you'll stand naked before your God. There will be a judgment for Christians, yes, not for purposes of condemning their sin but for purposes of rewarding their service. And everything I've done as a minister and everything you've done as a Christian in whatever service you're called to and everything you have not done as a Christian that you were called to and didn't do, all that will be taken into account and that's the serious side of judgment for Christians. No condemnation, but we could miss out on reward. And so Paul says, I take care to build on a good foundation, Christ, and to be careful what I build on that foundation, knowing that the fire of God's judgment will test my work, and if it's just stubble and wood, it'll go. I'll get by, but saved only by the skin of my teeth as through fire. But those who've built solidly on Christ, their work will survive. So a lot of church activity will go and be proved to have been worthless. But what a thrill to find that something you've done for the Lord survives that day. And you will be rewarded for it. God never lets anybody go without reward. You'll never get God in your debt. You'll never be able to say, God, you owe me something. <laughs> he always gets in first. You know, Peter said to Jesus, we've left all and followed you, Jesus. And Jesus said, no man has left me and lost houses and lands and property and all the rest of it without it being repaid a thousandfold. You don't give up anything if you sacrifice for the Lord. You never will. You'll never get God in your debt. And so there is reward as well as punishment. Punishment for those who have sinned and who have not had their sins forgiven. 
reward for those who have known the Lord and served him faithfully and well. And may I say this, that while my service for the Lord is fairly public, that's not by my choice, it's because the Lord put me here, but the Lord sees all the secret service that you do and how much more there is of that than those of us who are in the public eye in Christian service. So you may have done something that nobody else knew about it, don't you worry. God saw that in secret and he'll reward you openly. Number three, the punishment of the wicked. I wish I could stop believing in hell. I, I hate the idea. All my human instincts are against it. I can find a dozen objections to the idea of hell. I can find moral objections. I can find philosophical objections. I can find, find practical objections. I can find psychological objections. I can find theological objections. And all of them fall before one fact, and that is it was Jesus who taught it. The Savior of the world, Son of God, the greatest lover there's ever been. It was he who taught it. Hell is only mentioned once in the rest of the New Testament apart from on the lips of Jesus and it's on his brother James who mentions it just once about the tongue being set on fire by hell. Otherwise all our teaching on hell comes not from the Old Testament, not from the epistles of Paul, it comes from the Gospels and from Jesus himself. I dare not disbelieve. And Jesus spoke in terms of that horrible deep dark valley at the south of Jerusalem where they flung the rubbish and where the maggots ate what was left and the bonfires are still burning to this very day burning the rubbish and where Judas hanged himself going to his own place and that deep dark valley was called the valley of Hinnom or Gehenna and when Jesus spoke of hell he said you think of that valley that's what it's like to be outside the city of God and there's one part of that valley so deep the sun never touches it and Jesus said outer darkness we're going to have power cuts this winter, but you imagine living with yourself in the dark forever. And the thought is so horrible that I can understand why Jesus said it's better to lose one of the members of your body than to go to hell with the whole of your body. You notice he uses the term body there. And so there is a hell, and it's part of Christian belief about the future. And if you say God is not loving to have such a place, I say you are libeling God. And I say God loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever will believe in him will not perish and not go there but have eternal life. What more could God do, I ask you, and remain a moral God? And so God has taught us about hell, the punishment of the wicked. And finally, the last thing, Sorry, second last thing we believe about the future, the blessedness of the righteous. Heaven. Oh, there's such a place. It's beyond anything you can imagine. It's better than you can possibly think. Heaven is the most wonderful place you ever heard of, ever dreamed of, ever imagined. And I just praise God that it's a place that somebody like me can get to by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. People dismiss it as picture language. Look, I believe there's a real city in that heaven. I believe it's a real place, but it's not the place that's exciting, though that's described in terms that almost leave me breathless. Whenever we want real glory and grandeur, you go to the Tower of London and look at the crown jewels. What do we do? We get the most precious, sparkling, colored things on earth to try and convey glory. And all those little jewels, tiny pea-sized things in the royal crowns are nothing compared with pearls that are big enough to make a gate out of. Well, you can laugh at the pearly gates if you, if you like. I won't laugh at them. Not when I walk through. And that city is waiting for us. And there's a place in it marked for you if you belong to Jesus. How exciting to go along looking for your name on a door, you know? Where's my room? Yes, I've got one ready for you. I've had it ready for you. And then we get so full of ambitions about getting a little bungalow down in Somerset as if that's the height of our ambition. Dear, oh dear. No. A tent or a cottage, what do I care? They're building a castle for me over there. Heaven is real, but the place is not the most wonderful thing about it. The most wonderful thing is to be in a world where there's no evil. 
to be in a world where God is everywhere, where God is so real, you don't have churches and temples and sanctuaries to worship in. God is everywhere. The kitchen is as holy as anywhere else. A place where God lives with his people. You know, the Son of God came down to earth, is going to come again twice. But here we are told that God himself is coming. God himself is coming and will dwell with them and be their God. Which brings me to the final thing, the recreation of the universe. Heaven includes a new earth. We will think of heaven as something vague and, and spiritual and somewhere else. But this universe of ours is to be taken back to its constituent material or constituent energy. It's to go back to fire, the whole lot of it. And a few years ago a scientist stated that if we just had the machinery, the apparatus, we now know that we could start a chain reaction that would dissolve the universe in fire in just over 40 minutes. That's the discovery of our universe as being made up of fire. And the Bible says God will turn it back to fire and then out of the energy recreate new planets, new stars and a new earth. A new earth. With no oceans. That always struck me as strange. My first reaction was no holidays by the seaside. <laughs> there's something about the ocean I love. But then I realized why God was doing it. If there's one thing that's divided men from each other and made national boundaries, it's the oceans. We still talk about overseas. But then when people are dwelling together, no oceans. Rivers, yes, but no oceans. And so a recreated universe with a new earth. And you will not be stuck on earth because you'll have bodies like Jesus' body. And Jesus just stepped out into space as easily as I talk to you now. And so you'll travel that universe. I just can't wait to get there. Exploring that universe. And people think we'll just be sitting down in armchairs with embroidered antimacassars R.I.P. <laughs> no. This universe will be fascinating. There'll be things to do. We shall serve God. We shall be creative. God has made us creative like himself and there'll be so many things to create in glory. We'll create music. We'll... I just can't begin to imagine it. Let's not try because it's just going to spoil it. If there's one thing puts me off, it's these accounts from spiritous mediums of walking around in gardens smoking cigars. You know the kind of... It makes it too much like earth. It's just a projection of, of the best we know here. But eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man to imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Far better than anything you can possibly imagine. But will you take it on trust? This is what we believe about the future. Do you wonder that Christians have a confidence that others don't have? It, it troubles Christian others sometimes that Christians seem so sure, but they're not sure of themselves, they're sure of God. And that's a different thing. To be sure of God is wonderful when you face the future. Now, in my first little sermon tonight, I spoke of the events that lead up to the end of this age and the coming of Antichrist. Whether those final things will happen in my lifetime or not, whether I will share them or not, I don't know. But in my second half, when I talked of the coming of Christ, the resurrection of the body, the judgment of the world, the punishment of the wicked, the blessedness of the righteous, and the recreation of the universe, I'm talking of things that everybody will share in somewhere. And therefore, I've been speaking about your future. And somewhere in that pattern, every one of you is at this moment. For those who do not believe now in the Son of God, the wrath of God abides on them now. And those who believe have already started to live the everlasting life that will simply continue into that lovely new world. Where do you stand? If you did die tonight, where would you be? And that searching question, if God says to you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you reply? There's only one reply that will open those gates. It is, I believe in Jesus, your Son, as my Savior and Lord.
and the kingdom of heaven is opened to all believers. Let us pray. If you're not ready for this future, I just hope and pray that I've disturbed you very deeply and that you'll not find any peace until you make your peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross that you might be forgiven your sins. Don't go to bed tonight till you've got on your knees before him and confess that you're a sinner and that you're not ready to be judged and that you seek his mercy. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've done everything you should have done to open heaven to us sinners. Praise you for your grace. Lord, may every one of us respond to that grace as we ought while there is yet time. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's look forward 10,000 times 10,000 in sparkling raiment bright. The armies of the ransomed saints throng up the steeps of light. Tis finished, all is finished, their fight with death and sin. Fling open wide the golden gates and let the victors in. 407.